Hey, everybody, we're back. Brand new Cabral House Go. Yesterday was episode 3200 of the show. Today's 3201. If you want to follow along, head on over to stephencabral.com slash 3201. Each and every weekend, I get to answer your questions on all things wellness, weight loss, weight gain, anti-aging, longevity, high performance health, whatever it might be. I'm happy to do my best to answer those questions based on now about 25 years of experience working with clients just like yourself helping hundreds of thousands of people uh, on our team. So, all right, let's dive into it. First question today, opening up that amazing document, the Ask Cabral document my team puts together. This first one is from Laura. All right, Laura says, Hi, I know we've mentioned the glucose goddess before, but I've had lots of people telling me that her information is real. They've been checking their spikes after meals, and since she should suggest fruit should be after an after, eaten after a meal because it's sugar, I feel confused about when to eat fruit again. I'm aware that it digests faster, so it should be eaten before, and it ferments in the stomach, which causes bloating. But I would get, I would like to get proper suggestions on how to eat fruit because I do it a lot, especially in the summer. When to eat an apple? When to eat a watermelon? Also, a savory breakfast, okay. In which I can't use DNS, so I don't think smoothies are the best option for me. I've been advised to eat protein for breakfast to balance hormones. Okay, so here's the big thing: it's not like this is new information, right? It's like I know that it's a catchy name and I know that, but like this has always been known. If you don't want to see a glucose spike, you eat protein and fiber first. 20 plus years ago, uh, 25 plus years ago, when I was helping clients specifically with body transformation, we would call it front loading a meal. Before every meal, our clients would have an arugula salad or some type of salad just olive oil dressing, maybe a little bit of balsamic. That's what we were doing back then. And then they would then have their meal. And because of that, they weren't as hungry because one, 20 minutes before the meal, we started to have some salad, fill up the stomach, add fiber. So then it slows the digestion of everything else. And that's totally fine to do and still not bad today unless you're eating sugar at the meal. So here's the issue. I can't do things that are just It's not within me to do things that are cute and fun and disregard health. They're not like when people don't know if they can eat an apple, that's what's wrong with the world today because they're worried about getting a glucose spike there. I'm telling you right now, it is okay to have an apple as a mid afternoon snack. It's okay. It's okay. We've just become obsessed. We've become obsessed with the culture that, oh, I have a CGM now, so I can never have my blood sugar rise above 100 or 110. It's just not true. It's not true at all. There's no literature at all that says you don't live as long if you eat an apple. Like it's just it, the, this, we've taken it too far. That's all. People shouldn't be eating fruit with their meal. Fruit is meant to have as a great breakfast, start to breakfast, between meals. It's energy-based food. It's meant to be digested into the system and used for energy. It's not meant to be a dessert. It's not meant to be like you, if you want to, you can, but that's not what it's meant for. It's kind of like creating paleo beer. Well, paleolithic people weren't drinking beer, but we'd want to make it fit our dogma. So now we have Paleo bear, right? We've got keto wine. How does keto wine even exist, right? They're like, oh, well, it's sugar alcohol, so it's not really sugar. Okay, however you want to slice it, whatever makes you, you know, helps you sleep at night is great, right? But, but these things just aren't true. So yes, you will not get as pronounced a glucose spike when you eat fruit after meal. But here's the, here's the next step. If you never eat fruit, then you'll get even less of a glucose spike. And then you're like, okay, well, if I don't eat carbs, then I get even less. So then what do you do? You just end up eating fat, right? Eventually, like protein, well, you get a little like a little boost from protein. Okay, so I can't eat that. So now what do you do? You don't eat anything except things that won't affect it at all. And here's what they found then. That increases all-cause mortality, right? A high-fat diet, predominant fat diet, the keto diet that so many people were... Again, remember all the people that are promoting keto diet. Look at all the books written. That has been shown to increase all-cause mortality. So let's just be careful about not eating like humans and doing what's cute and fun for the day. And Laura, this isn't anything against you. This is just about this madness of manipulating food and the way that we think about it. It's just gone too far. All right. Marlise is up next. Thank you for all the work you do. Work 
I read your book about one and a half years ago. I was very encouraged when I read anything that I can be healed. I think I've gone through every applicable lab and detox protocol you have, except for fatlosity, aka Metavolve. I did the labs and protocols to help heal myself in eczema and IBS and chronic cough I've had for eight and a half years. I'm so frustrated because I still have IBS and a chronic cough. I really can't say they're any better than they were. The eczema is the only thing I can say that has gotten better. I was so hopeful and now I don't know where to go from here. I just finished the mold protocol, which is the last on the list to do. I'll be doing another seven day functional medicine detox in September. All right. Marley's, uh, my, Number one recommendation is that you need to work with a professional. You don't have to work with our team. Let's say like, ah, you know, I, I did this protocol. I did that. You need someone to fine tune this for you. It, it, this is like, it's trying to read it from a book, which nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But the most severe people, like the most severe cases, you have to have a coach. You really do. And here's the thing. Don't work with our team. Like that's the thing. Like I'll, Cause I don't want to be promotional. Don't work with our team. Go to integrativehealthpractitioner.org, click on the practitioners tab, select any IHP level two, whoever kind of like fits the connection with you. Don't choose us, choose one of them. We make zero dollars off of any IHP. Go with them. I want you to work with someone, but it doesn't have to be us, okay? So now here's what we need to do though. There's an answer for everything. If you have IBS, you have like that you it's almost it's not almost it's impossible not to then have candida overgrowth or bacterial overgrowth or h pylori or ibs or food sensitivities and with that there's going to be leaky gut and chronic inflammation okay so the chronic cough can be from the chronic inflammation so we have to fix the gut first now it's gotten a little better because you remove some food sensitivities, which you must have, and that got rid of the eczema. Good. Like you take that win and know that you can get, you can heal everything because you have a win. You, you beat eczema, right? Which is predominantly is a food sensitivity. So, okay. But we have more to go. So don't give up. Remember, it took me 10 years. It shouldn't take you 10 years. It should take about six months for hard cases. I'd given a keynote this year at Reimagine Health Summit, um, 10 months for one of the hardest cases I've worked with. So you can do this. You don't need to work with us, but you need to work with a coach on a monthly basis and then email them weekly for adjustments to your protocol. The hardest case is you have to work with a professional that does this every single day, that they know this inside and out, and they can tweak these protocols for you. They can custom tailor it for the hardest cases because everybody can heal. You really can. And like I said, I'm a promoter of this industry not just of us. Like you don't have to work with us. All right. Missy's up next. Missy says, my husband blew out his bursa sac on his left knee. After several appointments, it is now down to surgery to live with the pain. He's an independent remodel contractor. So his knee is a constant weather doing flooring, tile, ladders, or steps. What can you recommend for a condition like this, dealing with the pain, planning for surgery, any knee braces that would help before surgery. I'm sure you can help because of your trainer background and overall knowledge. All right. Missy, happy to help and appreciate you. Appreciate the question. Sorry to hear about your husband. And you know, all of these things are trying, like they're really difficult. So if surgery is absolutely necessary, then yeah, then you have to do surgery, right? So what do we do before surgery? We get that body as healthy and strong as possible. And that includes the muscles around the knee. You'll recover from surgery so much faster if the body is strong. So when you're in pain, it's challenging. So what can you do? Can you do some bike? Can you do some one-legged body weight squats? Like what can you do to keep the body strong? All right. Second is that we want to get the nutrition dialed in. So he's on more of an anti-inflammatory plan. Go back to my shows, foundation of all diets, Mediterranean based style diet, uh, obviously high in antioxidants, try to do the daily foundational protocol level two, uh, with vitamin D, probably 4,000 to 5,000 I use per day. But again, I can't give any medical advice, medical trim plans, medical cures, medical diagnosis. And then before the surgery, you'll need to stop the omega-3s because uh, omega-3s act as a natural blood thinner. But again, I can't give you any medical advice. Uh, in the meantime, though, again, besides the strengthening, we're going to do some uh, massage. So just some manual limb drainage to get, if it's, if there's a lot of inflammation, we need to drain that leg. So just some natural massage, uh, some light rebounding, if it's not too painful, and then also legs up on a wall. So basically you bring your hips into a wall, you put your legs up on the wall for five to 10 minutes. It lets things drain back down. 
also can be helpful while working is a neoprene sleeve or a compression sleeve. There are some materials that are cleaner than others, but that compression can sometimes take away the pain and don't, it doesn't allow as much of that fluid to accumulate there, which honestly creates a lot of the, a lot of the pain. So I can't give you medical advice. Check with this orthopedic doctor. And then um, again, wish you all the best, Missy. All right. And then of course, post-surgery, check out my podcast on post-surgery, what to do. Uh, Pana Giata, Pana Giata. Oh, I wish I knew how to pronounce this name. Oh, well, it's P-A-N-A-G-I-O-T-A. -A -A. Beautiful name. And uh, just don't know how to pronounce it. All right. It's a, this person says, hello, first of all, I would like to thank you for all the information that you put out for our health. I've been a listener of your podcast for the past six years. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being along for the ride. Learn so much and you have helped me with so much with my testing and supplements. I trust your advice. My question is about chlorine in the pool. I love to swim three times a week. I love to swim in the ocean in the summers when I go to Greece and I use the pool at my local fitness club here in the United States for the rest of the year. What is the best way to protect and remove the chlorine from my body externally and internally? I know chlorine gets absorbed through the skin and through inhaling it. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thanks so much. Okay, so I've actually, I've answered this before. So go to stephencabral.com slash podcast in the search box, uh, type in chlorine. You'll see a bunch of different posts in this, but we did this for my daughters too, because when they were younger taking swim lessons, uh, we wanted to be able to get that chlorine off their body and have it not do as much harm. And now it was only once a week. We tried to find a pool with saltwater pool. There was none in Boston. There was one in Cambridge. We just couldn't make it over there at the time that the class was. Uh, anyway, but, um, but now we have a saltwater pool and obviously it's much better. But here's what we would do. Now, again, not all pools allow this. We would just use a little bit of coconut oil. So as a basically block or barrier on the skin. Now, it makes it a little slippery in the water. So I'm not going to say that it doesn't. But it's basically like a moisturizer. And you just can kind of rub it on if you want before you go in the pool. It does not allow, it still allows your skin to breathe. So it's not that it doesn't, but it can just help a little bit, um, as a blocker. The, there might be other lotions by now, by the way, I just don't, just don't know of them because you don't want to really block the skin too much. You want to be able to let your skin breathe. All right. The next thing that we did was that, uh, when they came home for a bath, we used a vitamin C pellet in the tub. And so the vitamin C just fizzed out throughout the tub. It had like sodium bicarbonate in it, some magnesium and vitamin C, almost like a little Myers cocktail. And it went in the bathtub and the vitamin C helps to remove a lot of the chlorine. Uh, what else do we do after that? Uh, before they, once they got right out of the pool, we, we um, use a natural shampoo, got it right off their body. I recommend doing that as well. So right when you get out the pool, just wash off as much as possible. And the next thing is internal vitamin C. So that's a great, helpful detoxifier. We have a product now called the Daily Detox Support. That's very helpful. And the last one I want to share with you is something called Daily Thyroid Support. If you are swimming quite often in a chlorinated pool and you haven't checked your thyroid, which I would on the stress mood and metabolism test, you might use the Daily Thyroid Support, at least maybe on your swimming days. Um, although it's, you know, the iodine in it, it can be great every day. And it's what helps to uh, get rid of, and because chlorine is always trying to displace iodine, iodine can help with the removal of the chlorine as well. So something to look at, and I think that was a bunch of tips, so hopefully that's helpful as well. All right, let's see. We answered uh, Penagiata, Missy, Marlies, and Laura. Let's get to one more question here today. Uh, we've got another Laura, and Laura says, Hi, Dr. Ball. My Chinese medicine practitioner advised me to reduce damp dampness in my body, but I really love green juices and smoothie bowls. They're essentially they're essential for getting my nutrients. Is there any way to incorporate them while still combating dampness? Thanks so much. Yeah, this is a great question. I've actually answered this before too, but no problem. You don't have to uh, search all of these. I'm happy to answer them. So when I was living in Boston in the cold, in the winter, and in Maine, I lived one winter in Maine, I've always lived, you know, in New England in the winter. I didn't want to stop drinking my smoothies because easiest way for me to get my nutrition and my green juices. I drink that as well. And so all I did during the winter, really simple, really easy, is I added about a half a thumb of ginger to my smoothies. So that ginger helps decrease dampness and helps add heat to the body. That's all I did. Like plain, simple, easy, amazing for digestion right? So that's a good thing. Good for the kidneys, good for the intestines, great for balancing calm, calmness and anxiety. 
Uh, and so that's what I did. And then some people like to use a little cayenne. So you're welcome to put a little cayenne in your green juice. You can use ginger in your green juice, ginger in your smoothie, like blueberries and ginger, by the way, tastes amazing. Uh, blueberry, ginger, a little mango tastes amazing. But anyway, I could go down a rabbit hole with a little pineapple in there. Um, and then green juice, if you're fresh pressing it, just get a little ginger, uh, ginger and a little lemon as well. Lemon, ginger in those, that little bit of heat, a little bit of that acidity in there uh, can really go a long way with combating that dampness. And then also, it's just, it's just one thing. I always let my smoothie kind of warm up for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So it's not ice cold, but by the way, blending it kind of warms it just a little bit. Green juice, obviously you just, you don't need to wait on that. You just put your ginger, your lemon in there, pinch a cayenne if you want, all that's phenomenal. So yes, you don't need to eliminate these uh, in order to improve overall digestion, cold in the body, dampness, totally get it. But yeah, this helps to combat it. All right, Laura, and thank you everybody for writing in here today. I thank you. I appreciate you. I'm going to be back tomorrow with a brand new Cabral Concept on our Mindset and Motivation Monday. Don't miss it. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.